This program is brought to you by Emory University. tonight. Um, my name is Adam Mirza and I'm a visiting assistant professor in music composition here at the Emory, uh, at Emory University. And I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's concert and to this pre-concert talk uh, with Peter Evans and Sam Pluta and our own Dr. Dwight Andrews. Um, I'd like to, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge a few of the sponsors and people who've made this event possible. Uh, our chair, Kevin Carnes, Emory Music Department, in particular, the staff, Kathy Summers, Alexandra Shatilov, and Derek Montgomery, who really helped with all the logistics. We received tremendous institutional support from entities at Emory, the Donna and Marvin Schwartz Foundation Artists in Residence Program, the Rosemary McGee Creativity Conversation Series, and Center for Creativity and Arts, who are the sponsors for this talk. And I'd also like to t thank tonight's technical crew, Heather Pine and Brian Adams, Heather Pine, the theater tech assistant and Brian, our sound, health sound engineer. Uh, so tonight's talk and concert are part of a two-day residency titled Super Collisions. And I just thought I'd give you a little bit of an explanation of where that title came from. Um, the first place it came from was Super Collider. That's the software Sam uses to build his crazy electronic instruments. But also we can think of acoustic collisions, the visceral, elemental, particulate nature of sound. I think you'll hear some of this physical aspect tonight. Collisions between composition and performance that take place in free improvisation. Collision between acoustic and electronic music that happens in what we call live electronics. And creative, coll co creative collisions between individuals, artists and students, performers and audience members. Um, I just lastly, I'd like to draw your attention to the back page of our program. I think you guys have those. Just so you can see other residency events. Uh, our two guest artists have already had several meetings with our students, and the students have loved them. And that will continue tomorrow. Peter is giving a talk um, tomorrow in here in Pass at 12 noon, um, talking about his approach to trumpet performance improvisation and showing some of his compositions as well, I believe. And Sam will present some of his, his notated music to, to the composition students at 2.30. Those are, that, sorry, that Sam's event will be upstairs in the main building in room 307. And I think that is most of it. Let me just quickly point out our, our guests. We have Peter Evans, trumpet player, Sam Pluta, laptop artist, composer, and Dr. Dwight Andrews, our own professor of, um, at Emory. And so with that, I think we'll just like launch into it and I, I I can start off with a question, perhaps, or should we jump? Okay, so the first question I wanted to, I want to ask you guys is if you could talk a little bit about your instrument, each of your instruments, how you, how you relate to your instruments, how you make sound on your instrument, and how you make music through your instrument with other people. Okay, well, I uh, was taught trumpet when I first started I think to keep me out of trouble. And uh, my first teacher was a retired band director. Um, and I just liked the noise it made. So fast forward, you know, another decade or so. I mean, I, I basically uh, got into music in general. And then the trumpet became something a little bit secondary. Um, things became a lot more interesting after that, so you know, if I played like a, I, I played in a youth orchestra and we played Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, and that that's the first time that I the composition light went off in my head of like, oh, he's got this thing, and he's Rubik's cubing it and he's turning it around and that the viol violin's doing that and then the percussion's doing that and oh, okay, music, and it it did it reminded me of the jazz that I was already listening to because you know Coltrane, Bud Powell, and these these people do similar things in their music. So once that once that started to go together. Uh, the, the instrument just became just a platform for me to explore music, and um, there's a couple different parts to your question, but that's the, that's the gist of it. What was the last part? How you could play with other people? I don't. I mean, I don't. 
I don't really care that Sam plays electronics, and I don't think he really cares that I play the trumpet. You know, like I wasn't looking for a guy that, well, actually, that's not true. I was looking for somebody that played electronics. But that's not really what our relationship's about. So, like, I don't really care that Craig Tabor plays the piano. There's something much larger going on there. And so, but it's a paradox, right? Because that, that the vehicle for this creativity is this really special and very particular relationship with the uh, technology, with the instrument. And, and this kind of feedback loop between what, like, what the instrument wants to do and what you want to do and letting your desire do something to this piece of technology, but also letting the te piece of technology uh, modulate your desire, you know? So uh, that's kind of where I'm at with, with it at this point. It's, it's weird because I'm not really much of a trumpet geek, but I really developed a quite personal relationship with the uh, interface or that, that, that way of making sound. Um, and I think it's affected how I think about music too. Yeah, I think it's an it's an interesting point about the not caring what instruments we play. I you know I played this electronics, but but really uh, what you know I'm a I'm a professor of composition, and I, I oftentimes I think one of the hardest lessons to get across to some students because they're so like focused on getting their notes down on the page is uh, is like you need to make personal relationships with the people you make music with. So we you know we're we're friends. We've been friends for a long time, and uh, and part of it is that we also make not only l like making music together and it takes us to a different kind of uh, plane of consciousness but it's also like you know we make each other laugh too so it's really and 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 we like to have a whiskey together and I think that that getting that across uh, and that aspect of of this uh, this art form uh, is 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 important is is getting across that, that it's not really it is about the music but it's really about the communication um, and that being said I, I play this I play this electronics and I've kind of started to define myself more in playing electronics so I have an analog synthesizer over there um, and and the analog synthesizer is it's a synthesizer it's not a computer I'm kind of known as a laptop performer but that's a that's a synthesizer and um, and then I'm also playing the computer and what I'll do is I'll take in sound of Peter's trumpet uh, I'll take in sound of the synthesizer and then I'll put them through my software and do things with them. Uh, and, and through that, that uh, what, what I like about this instrument is like seeing any improvisation, maybe duo, there's a, there's a direct connection between what we're doing, right? Like, you know, even if it's acoustic, right? It's, it, there's a communication and you, you hear somebody do something and then you do something. And so it's this, it's this feedback loop of sound. Um, in this situation, it's literally a feedback loop of sound. So I'm taking their sound. I'm taking Peter's sound or whoever I'm playing with and warping it and spitting it back out. Not only is there a connection between uh, what I do as a human and uh, what Peter did, but then there's also a connection between my sound and the sound that Peter made. So, um, yeah. Oh, we had a question. Yeah, please. please. Yeah. yeah. You should say something. Yeah, it was actually uh, pretty uh, late in my degree at Austin. So I, I had been, I had been making these pieces. I started making like tape pieces, you know, to, and I still do that. So I, I love that stuff, and I, I do a lot of mixing. But um, but I started making these tape pieces, and then I started doing live electronics. And really, my live electronics were pieces, so they're fully notated, where somebody plays. There's microphones, and there's processing, and it spits it out. But like the part, their part is composed. And I, I did music for a play at UT Austin in my third year of my master's. So I had a long master's. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that was my first master's. And, uh, and uh, what I realized was there was a situation where, um, where I had to start triggering stuff live and doing things differently. And that was the first time I kind of did this. And then the guitarist, it was me and a guitarist, and the guitarist couldn't make the, one of the gigs. And I had to play solo this, like, two hour long play. And so I had to really make things up. I really had to make it work, and it, and it did work. Uh, and then, and then I, I moved to England and started also continuing to write pieces. And what happened was I was writing the software, and the software did things sequentially. And at some point it clicked that uh, if the software were not sequential, but I could change the order of the operations of the software, that Goes, that's a switch from composition into improvisation. So it's a switch from performance, composition is performance, but to more like live 
uh, changing the ideas of what's going on. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> my instrument is clarinet. That, that was the instrument I was trained on. And uh, when I was a kid, I got a chance to hear a wonderful saxophonist and reed player by the name of Yusuf Latif. And Yusuf was playing oboe and bassoon and flute on a gig. I had never heard, as a kid, I would never heard anyone playing and improvising on the bassoon. And so that fascinated me so much, and the idea of being able to go from one instrument to another, that really, then I started to focus on woodwind instruments. It was really because of Yusuf. And so then I went to school and you know studied doubling for woodwind instruments and things like that. And so that was, I regard woodwind instruments really as my, as my instrument. I play the flute and bass clarinet and, I think in some ways I got on some of my early new music gigs because I had all the instruments. I had a piccolo and I had a bass flute and so and everything in between. Uh, and so they said, yeah, let's let's get Dwight to do it, you know, because I would have the arsenal of, uh, of instruments. But it was because of my interest in many different colors and trying to find different uh, approaches to making sound on these instruments. And uh, I really fell in love with uh, the idea of improvisation, new music improvisation. Uh, because it really created a new kind of responsibility of the encounter. Um, and um, the formative musician for me was a guy by the name of Wadada Leo Smith. And Leo would not let you play anything that he ever heard you play before. Uh, he would stop you, in fact, and say, what was that that you just did? And I said, you know. So he forces you to play in the moment, in the music. And I found that to be the most demanding and exciting and exhilarating thing because you were constantly responding, like you're saying, to, uh, to what you were hearing and what you could put into the, into the mix. And um, that's what drew me into this whole process. And then you're constantly searching not for techniques or scales, but for sounds and for ideas and for sonic complexes. And, um, and so I'm not an electronic musician, although I'm fascinated and want to be, because I want to understand how to make that, put that in my, you know, in my toolkit. Uh, but I'm primarily an acoustic musician who has kind of just worked with people who do electronics. But that's what got me into it. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, I was wondering, perhaps we could now have each of you demonstrate a little bit of how you, now we've talked about it, or how you make sound, perhaps see a little of your trumpet playing and with Sam, what you do with electronics, and then I think you have a, a clip, and, and, and perhaps we can go through those and then give some people some audio ideas and maybe entertain some more questions. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> or do you want to, do you want to talk through the, um, your, your, yeah, great. Because it's a weird feedback circuit, is uh, it, that it's very, uh, very weird. So I'll show you that. Now, what I like about that is that um, I don't really know. Like those, none of those sounds make any sense as to like where I'm putting the, the knobs, because the knobs are left to right frequency, and yet the, the result is this really nonlinear thing. So I, I like that, and I want to engage with that. Uh, I'll show you another one on here. We've got, I don't want to give too much away, but that's a good one. Yeah. So that's a fun one. And what I actually have that sound being routed in through my software, and uh, I can do things with that. So you heard this. So I can do this. So what, that, what, that, what that's doing is taking the, the, the already glissing downward thing, and then it's making multiple copies of it and making those gliss downward. So it becomes this polyphony of glisses. 
And I can take that and I can I can grab the sound that I'm making and do things with it. So I can do this. Now, that's being funky. So basically what I do is I take sounds and I grab them and I do things with them. Now some of those sounds might be what he's doing. So yeah, hopefully that didn't scare you too much. Uh, I think you'll like it, really. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so maybe <laughs> Peter can talk about his sound. just a, a clip of um, a recording that I made uh, because I wanted you to hear some of the kinds of musics that I found were interesting. They are a part of a free improvisational world, uh, but in this particular instance, I'm going to play some music by Anthony Braxton, the composer. And Braxton had a large orchestra that he toured Europe with for several years. And so this is just a, a piece that was recorded by his creative music orchestra uh, in Cologne. And so I'm just going to play one little uh, segment of a much longer piece. But in this piece, you'll hear a, a composer who's very, very interested in composing details that he wants to set in motion a world of improvisation. And so uh, Braxton uses various techniques, but I'll just let you listen to it and then we can This is called Language Improvisations, and it's Anthony Braxton and the Creative Orchestra. And I'm playing uh, one of the many saxophones in this orchestra. space you created there. Do you want me to talk a little about, about making that, those, that come together? 
Well, part of uh, what was so exciting about this creative music orchestra, it was a really a large orchestra of all improvisers. So it was a unique group of players. I mean, you were listening to James Emery and Roscoe Mitchell and all these, all these guys that were there at the same time. So each of them had their own particular character of improvising, but then Braxton created this context with these elaborate scores uh, that oftentimes didn't contain regular note notation, but it was kind of graphic notation, these shapes and objects, and oftentimes uh, in front of the whole orchestra, he, he would hold up one image uh, to the saxophones and then dance to another image for the trumpets. And so what you were hearing is him kind of conducting us through uh, a very detailed uh, approach to a composition. But in addition to that way of notating and kind of creating these wonderful environments, and I think that was Ray Anderson, I don't think that was George, it sounded like Ray Anderson uh, playing the trombone. But in addition to that, he took a lot of time to write completely notated scores and then give you room for improvisation. And the charts that he wrote were blisteringly hard. That's all I remember is that it was really hard music. So I wanted to play just one quick clip of the orchestra playing essentially a chart but it was a chart that uh, Braxton had written uh, really based on a tone row. So, you know, he was a great student of Abern and all of that. So uh, you, you, you see this eclectic sense of his many influences. Let me just play a little bit of this piece. Uh, it's called Composition 55. Oops, wait, not yet. forever uh, before we went on the road because the music was just too hard and Braxton could hear uh, whatever was not right. So that was pretty scary. So here we go. This is composition number 55 and it sounds like this. <laughs> Hearing you describe these, these, and listening to the tracks, you know, I, there's such a a wide, it's kind of space of possibilities that artists have created through free improvisation and through and, and free improvisation, but then also with notation, with conduction, with how how to hand, how to interact with each other, and you know, I I, I, I mean. So these are some larger group ensembles. I know you guys obviously are perform often and the duo form that we'll hear tonight um, with you playing acoustic on the trumpet and then and Sam grabbing the sounds and doing his thing, but you also have a larger gr groups, uh, quintet and also the, what's the four, the rocket science. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and so and one thing, and uh, one other point I wanted to mention was that that there's this intersection between all three of our artists here and that, you know, one of the, the great things with this whole amazing scene of free improvisation, or many scenes of it, are how the musicians interact with each other, come to, come to play with each other. And uh, we were talking outside a little bit and I wanted, you know, I mentioned I wanted to ask you, try to figure out who you guys have actually played with together, or uh, not, not at the same time, but over the same, the musicians you've worked with. So we, we said George Lewis for sure. You've all you've all played. Yeah, Warren Smith on that tour. Yes. 
All right, I'll tell you why I just played with one last year. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, I don't, uh, there's this sense, I mean, Roscoe Mitchell has this, I, this idea of the super musician, this idea that, like, musicians are, are evolving and that every generation is getting more acclimated to deal with uh, a hybridity on a more detailed level, and that's, it's true, but there's something else going on, which is that that kind of person has always existed. So there's just more of them now, and you can, it's not really that hard to learn how to play giant steps anymore. Like, any 18-year-old jazz student can play giant steps and sound fine. No one wants to pay $5 to listen to it, but it's possible. There's no personality in it necessarily, but the level of, of a technique that you can learn easily to do that is just there. The, this, other people have walked those steps, so you don't have to do it. Um, but the idea of musicians being like this and being curious, they've kind of been around forever, and like something that I really place a lot of importance on in my own musical life is like an intergenerational thing. Like a lot of, I've had a lot of really important mentors that are like, 40 years older than me that I, are some of my best friends now, but they're also mentors, right? And so um, last year I did this concert at an art gallery where they, because of the artists that were being exhibited, they wanted a concert. It was, it was uh, Willem de Kooning and Zhao Wu Qi. So Zhao Wu Qi knew Varez and um, was a big music fan, and then um, Willem de Kooning knew all these bebop musicians and Charlie, like Charlie Parker and all this stuff. And then Varez and, and, and Mingus worked together in a studio session that didn't go very well. because Varez was, Varez was a little condescending. And, um, Anyway, so, so my task for this concert was, they, want, they said you, they wanted a concert of the music of Charlie Parker and Varese in one concert. So, okay, so I'm thinking, who do I know that could actually navigate both of those worlds creatively? Not just, we're not just gonna play confirmation down, and we're not just gonna play ionization straight down. And so one of the first people I thought of was like, how great would it be to get Warren on? So Warren Smith, if you guys don't know who he is, he's um, a percussionist that, um, basically he, has been doing everything under the sun since the early 50s. I mean, he played ionization for his high school graduation or college graduation. He knew the part from memory, the snare drum part. He was improvising on it. And um, he worked with, I don't think he worked with Varez, but he worked a lot of the, he worked with Stravinsky and he was Janis Joplin's music director and he played for in Tony Williams' lifetime. And uh, anyway, he's done everything. It was, he was actually like in the, big in the Broadway and the recording studio scene in New York, which used to be a really big deal. Um, so he was the perfect person for the, for the job, but it wasn't like, it really wasn't, once we were there, there's of course this thing of like, okay, this guy is like, we all really respect him, he's been around forever, but once we're playing, he's just a guy in the band. I mean, we don't, you know, there's a certain thing of like, yes, you're, you're like us, but you've just been doing it forever, for like a lot longer, and you're, you have a much wider perspective, you know? That's really all it is, but that idea of people being, uh, that is kind of what accounts for the fact that like we've played with like a bunch of the same people because we're looking for those kinds of people and like they're looking for us. Yeah, I think another thing that's really interesting, I mean, is that we're we're looking for these people, but we're also looking for people who have different backgrounds than us. So, you know, like I was saying, my background's in music concrete tape music, right? Um, you know, Peter's got a degree in tr classical trumpet. Um, you know, music yeah, music theory. I mean. <laughs> Man, so so there's so what what's what's uh, there was a this educator that Peter and I did a workshop with in, in Houston named Dave Dove and I uh, he said this thing and I'll I, I'll just repeat it I'll just keep repeating it is like improvisation has no style it, it has it it has no you know it has there's no genre it's all of them and like if you want to be playing in a you know if if we're playing and somebody starts playing a rock beat behind us we'll figure out how to do something with it, right? So, so it's uh, what's exciting um, in these a lot of these situations is bringing in people f that are totally different, um, and uh, and and then all of a sudden the music just totally changes, and all of a sudden you start doing. We we uh, Peter and I was were playing in a band uh, a couple years ago, and and one of the guys is a real uh, hip hop producer and and funk musician and jazz musician, and and he brought this whole other thing to the music, and all of a sudden we're in a groove and. Um, and I was, I was impressed by myself. I felt like I could play in a groove, which is, <laughs> which I was. Um, and I was wondering if you could say anything about like maybe w one of the stranger musicians you've played with, or or somebody who brought something to the table you just didn't, and you it f flipped you around, and maybe in a good way or maybe in a bad way. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's interesting because I was thinking that all of these uh, encounters and these relationships. I mean, certainly there have been strange musicians. Uh, or not strange musicians, but strange encounters. And I always have to go back and think, was I the one that was strange in that? Or, you know, was it the other? Yeah, yeah. 
or was it someone else? I think, I think that for me, just coming into this world of music, which was so foreign to me after having gone to music school, I, I didn't know anything about this world of free improvisation, and I was already fully formed as a musician, or at least I thought I was. So having to bring all of that, you know, millions of years of conservatory training to a new music environment in which now you had to rethink everything that you knew about everything. That for me was just very strange. And so, you know, you had musicians making sounds in such unorthodox ways. And I, you know, for the longest time I kept saying, why is this so exhilarating and so terrifying at the same time? And it was because all of the issues of technique and all of those kinds of things were not what was important. So it was in finding a voice that I found so, so much of an opportunity. But th this, was, this conversation is a little scary for me though because as we think about the fact that we're all connected through all of these various musicians over the generations, when we made this recording, it was 1978. So that was what, 30, 40 years ago? Yeah, it's 40 years ago. You were born in Princeton. Okay. So that just goes to show you and the way Braxton has unfolded and all of these other musicians and the way the relationships are still continuing is really the fact that there is no style. It's that, you know, people are interested in it and curious mm -hmm. and then continue to make new music. process-oriented activity. So we, it's an unhappy marriage, this whole business of making art with uh, consumer culture, society, and even entertainment business. I mean, we fit what we're doing into the form of the entertainment business, like we're gonna play a concert tonight that's gonna have a clear beginning and end, and we're gonna make it seem like a coherent 45 minutes of music. Uh, but that's not really what's going on. That's just the, that's like the foam resting on top of the actual thing, which is uh, where it's like a river, and we're just scooping out some of the water to give to you for the for the 45 minutes. But the real thing is the river, so you're never going to see the whole picture. We and even we don't see the whole picture. So like in a way, like yeah, that record is made before I was born, but I I know those musicians, and in a way, like I'm part of that record in some weird way. If you look at time in in, in a different way than just like a sequence, you know. I mean, that's a, that's a, I've been thinking about this a lot. So I, I think that the reason I like improvisation is because it allows me to access this place in my consciousness that I believe one might call God or spirituality or, or religion. And it's this kind of, in my own experience, it's a different plane of existence where all of a sudden I'm not thinking, I'm, I'm not, I'm accessing like ask parts of my brain that I can't normally access and I'm I'm just going and like I'm sure if you did an EEG of my brain it would be just like blowing up right <laughs> and I can't honestly I think what draws me to music is that that's where I find that place now if I could find that place in something else I might do that thing but it's the only place where I can find that place so that's really exciting, um, and 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 what what hopefully we're doing is maybe sharing a little bit of that with 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 you, if 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 it's possible to communicate that from where we're at. Interestingly enough, for me, this whole issue of uh, music and spirituality is something I'm really just beginning um, to kind of unpack for myself because I always thought of myself as a musician and my spiritual side I always thought of quite separately, uh, except that in the last 20 years or so I've started to have experiences which I thought were transcendent experiences and I've been listening and studying the music of um, some of our elders like Train and others who I think turned a corner at a certain point in their careers where they, where they decided literally to let go of everything to be a vessel for that moment. And 
in my discovery of Train's approach to spirituality, I think that's been liberating for me. Uh, but it's also been, in a sense, the most um, the most difficult because I think to allow your music to be transcendent or to allow yourself to be a vessel, that's that's exactly when you have to completely let go of everything. And I think that, that uh, free improvisation has helped me to come grips with that, to let go of all the preparation and the practice and the charts and the rehearsals, to allow myself to, in that moment, be a vessel for something uh, sonic um, and ultimately spiritual. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit similar for me. Like, I think that I, f I mean, I went to like a, f not very fun Catholic church growing, you know, growing up, and I, that wasn't the way I found uh, the space that we're talking about. But I, I found it with music pretty, f f I would say, kind of quickly. Like, I was obsessed with Train when I was like 15, 16, and I was living in this this lily white suburb where there's nothing that resembled that around me at all. You know, I wasn't I wasn't part of any community that were that kind of thing was valued. So, but it, I just stuck with it. I just couldn't. It was like just drawing me to it, to that, whatever that thing is. And so as I uh, got older, I mean, I had this experience in college where my classical trumpet teacher basically made me participate in this uh, concerto competition, right? And so, I mean, the classical trumpet literature stinks. So it's like one of the main pieces that, one of the, the pillars of the repertoire is this piece by Hummel, this like D-grade Baroque com composer. But I took it super seriously and I spent a lot of time on it. I wasn't really that concerned with winning the thing, but I wanted to play the piece really beautifully. I was like, I want to play like a flute. And so, so I did. So I learned it, I memorized it, and in the first round of the competition, I, uh, I passed the neck to the finals, and all the judges, who were just other teachers at the school, gave my teacher their comments for the next round. So I was like, all right, well, let me have it. What are the comments? And they were like, they thought you sounded great. They didn't like the way you looked. And I was like, well, what was wrong with how I looked? And I was already playing jazz and improvising and stuff at this point. And they're like, well, you were like looking, you were like pointed down, and your eyes were closed, and you were like kind of withdrawn. And I was like, Hey, that's great. That means I found it. I'm like, I'm, f I'm, I'm flowing, but I'm playing this, this Hummel piece of shit, you know? So, so the thing is, so the, okay, that's one thing, but so later I was able, they, they wanted to see Maurice Andre or something, but that thing, the, that flow state, which I was, I was able to pick up on kind of quickly, the technical stuff took a lot more work in a way. As I've gotten older and I'm starting to realize how many other improvisers and how many other musicians have gone through this thing, like Train is like the obvious one, because he was checking out Inyat Khan and Yogananda and, and Utex Far, all these, all these different people. And so that's made me go into, into that, I guess, more, a more like universalist way of looking at this. And music is kind of the way that a lot of different spiritual traditions that's their, I mean, I don't know if you got, Inyat Khan was a, was a Sufi musician who basically stopped playing because he was like, I've actually become the instrument. Like, I'm not playing the instrument, I'm the instrument now, so I don't even need to play. And, I, and like, that's what Alice Coltrane did as well. I mean, she was just, she became a, a guru. So this thing of like, once you start thinking in those terms, how do you practice a scale, right? It becomes very, very different. How do you even honestly face this whole idea of self-annihilation, I mean, it becomes a real thing. What, how do I, if that's the really the task that's at hand here when you're, when you're trying to access that state, then it, it, you develop a much different sense of self-criticism and self-worth and all that stuff, and it changes everything. And once you start going in that direction, you can't go back. So it, it's almost like the, the obvious conclusion is to not play in a way, <laughs> actually. That's the, the, if, you took the, if you took it to its logical conclusion, you'd quit music because you are music. Yeah. So I'm not there yet. I'm happy that I'm not there. I think Coltrane probably would have just stopped playing. Yeah. You know? Some people did from that era. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's exactly right. And, and the, um, I mean, 
there are definitely some people who play this instrument well. There are not many. And part of the reason is because it's actually not good at playing things exactly. Like, it's just not good at it. Like, it's good at making, like, a, a, a fixed part that, you, that, um, that plays back exactly every time. You can press play in iTunes every, every day. It's exactly the same, right? Exact same bits. Literally the same ones and zeros come through, you know, come through the speakers. But as a performance instrument, it's actually not good at that. So what, but what it ends up being good at is it can, it can be, it's like, it can be making millions of random numbers every second, right? And so, so if you can embrace that, that aspect of the instrument, the fact that it's just not going to be the same every time, or, or you, you can make the computer, like the, as I'm playing, the computer's making thousands of decisions that I'm not making, and I'm just, I'm just guiding the bus. Uh, so, so, but being able to in, engage with that chaotic element of this instrument is something that allows you to play it well. It is within a frame, right? It's the randomness and 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 and, and chaos within a within a frame, and I know what that frame is, so that's <laughs> and that's just through practice, <laughs> yeah. I don't buy it. No, all the all the all the masters had insane technique. The technique might be defined in a different way, right? Like Cecil Taylor's technique is different from, you know, uh, Brad Meldow's technique. I'm just trying to throw out different piano players, but the really heavy improvisers have technique through the roof. That's not the point, right? It's in the service of something else. It's actually to allow the thing to flow, so you can listen and not be worried about what note you're playing. But um, I don't, I've never met a heavy improviser that doesn't deliver in, in that department. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I was, I think that's right, that in a sense, your development of your technique is kind of in preparation for then not thinking about that because you're thinking about making music. But Laura, you said something that I think is really at the crux of all of it. What I think uh, free improvisation or improvisation does and forces you to do is to listen. You have to be a virtuoso listener. You have to be able to hear and experience in the moment in profound ways so that you can know how you respond to the moment. And certainly my experience was that even though I had played you know, a lot of wonderful music and, and like you, the first time I played in the orchestra playing Rite of Spring and heard all of that sound around me, I said, oh my God, it was, like, it was like going to church. But that's a different kind of listening than listening in an, an improvised environment where whatever I hear from you right now is then what informs what I will say or not say. Uh, and so it's really the listening, and, and that's been my experience, that my listening, my, I don't know if my technique has gotten better, but my listening has gotten better over the decades. Yeah, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, as, as, as always, it feels like we keep going. Um, we're going to take a short break, and you guys are going to hear these guys deliver in spades. Um, so 15 minutes, and we'll start a little after 8. And thank you to, to, uh, to Peter and Sam and Dwight for joining this. We really wanted to bring these guys, these three together, so I'm really glad about that. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.